Hello, welcome to another episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. This is Matt Bingle speaking. I'm one of the co-hosts and the editor for this particular episode. I'm recording this brief message to let you know that this episode is audio only. This means that there will be no video footage of Jake, Chris, myself, or our special guest this episode. However, we will still have images and graphics on the screen to help you visualize what we're talking about. We apologize for any inconvenience this may cause, and we hope you enjoy the episode nonetheless. Hi, I'm Peter Lurie, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm here with Jake Devon Bob and as always. Our co-hosts, Chris Bixby and Matt Bingo. How you guys doing? We're good. Good, Jakey. How you doing? That's great to hear. I'm doing great as always. Thank you for asking. Hey, Chris, what do we have for today? Our guest for today, he is a uh, songwriter and composer. He's worked on Sesame Street. Going back to the beginnings, he worked with Jim Henson himself on the Jim Henson Hour and some other projects as well. We're here to talk about that and some other things he's done as well. And here he is, Mark Rodice. Mark, happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be on here. Of Hurry course. There, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a pleasure. So so to kick this off, so could you, uh, even though I kind of did already, in your own words, could you uh, introduce yourself a little bit and what you do? But I'm Mark Rodice, uh, and I always tell people, if you can say my last name, you can't spell it, and vice versa. So then, and then three times a year, people say Radice correct, and I usually congratulate them. Congratulations! You're the second one that got to say my name, my last name right. Um, <laughs> as far as introducing myself, I started recording in 1964. I was signed to RCA Records at the age of seven. Wow. And we put five singles there. I put out my first album at 12. I toured with Donovan at 16. I was in a disco band at 18. I toured with Aerosmith at age 20. Wow. I was with, uh, CBS songs from 82 to 90. Uh, Aerosmith just n- announced their uh, Peace Out tour. And I, I called Brad yesterday. He's a car player. But he doesn't usually answer me. <laughs> <laughs> I called him, I'm like, you know, if you're looking for keyboards and vocals for the Peace Out tour that starts in September, I already know all the songs. Yeah, <laughs> I toured them for two years. Nice. But, <laughs> uh, that piece of, like I said earlier, I did another interview a couple of years back with some friends of mine from my hometown, and after six hours of talking, we got up to age 20. So I just tried to push you through my 20, up to 20. <laughs> 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 30, 40, 50, 60. I'm currently 175, but it's not great <laughs> for my age. <laughs> All right, I'm, really, I'm really 65. You kinda, I know you kind of touched up on it earlier, but what made you want to get into the music industry? I always thought I wanted to be an astrophysicist, but 
Oh, people wow. Were Interesting. Me, and this was like at, at 12, right? Where people would tell me, no, oh, man, you're a genius. You're a prodigy. You should, you should you'll, you'll have a beautiful career. And wow. Yeah. About 10 years ago, a friend of mine called me. He said, 34 days. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I calculated if I listened to your songs back to back, how long it would take to listen to them all. 34 days. That was 10 years ago. Wow. So now it's probably 15 minutes. Wow. So I, really oh to listen. I, have, I have about 3,000 that aren't released yet that are recorded. But I'm never wow. going to live long enough to get them. Mm. Mm. And also, with Spotify uploading 100,000 uploads daily now. What? It's, it's wow. Because back when I was Back when I was selling records, what you had to do is you would have to be good enough to be taken to a record company who would take you to an A&R guy who would say, yeah, this is good. I'm going to take this to the guy who's in charge of signing. And then the guy would have to sign you or your band. And there was all, you had to sing, you had to play instruments. There was no fake stuff. So uh, once you got signed, they'd put some money into promotion and give it to radio stations. And then the average listener would have to, would listen to basically 40 songs a week, which were the best of the best of the best. And that's all you heard. You didn't hear all the stuff that just wasn't good enough to listen to. And nowadays, there's 100,000 uploads on Spotify daily from people. A lot of them don't sing, as you know. A lot of them don't play instruments. People take loops, like right, yeah, right, yeah, uh -huh. yep. They bought they bought the loop, and then since they can't sing, then they're gonna talk over the loop like this. So they got a new song on Spotify with the other hundred thousand, <laughs> hundred thousand yeah. a day of that. So I always tell people there's probably four songs coming out. Hmm. People singing, playing instruments today on Spotify. Good luck trying to find them. Yeah. Inside all of that. Right? Yeah. I got nothing yeah, against rap. It's created it's in its own way, but I'm, I'm the old guy now, now walking around going, <laughs> I'm like, hmm. once you get to be 40, what your kids listen to, you'll think is crap, I guarantee you. That's just the. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, who are some of your biggest musical influences? Whenever that gets asked on any like, the thing that I have to put that, I always say Beethoven and Dolly Parton because it's completely ridiculous. <laughs> but in real life, I would say the Beatles and the Stones, I grew up on those. And then oh, of course. Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. my poor parents. Mm -hmm. Once, once Led Zeppelin came out, my poor parents, because I have the immigrant song going on all day at eleven, like at the volume eleven. So my mother, <laughs> one day, yelled from the bottom of the stairs, "Mark, if you don't turn that down, I'm going to come up there and rip all your wires out." <laughs> so I walked over to the top of the stairs, like you know where they are. And we just both laughed. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's yeah. cute. Oh, yeah, that, and once, uh, the, all that stuff hit me around 17 or 18 years old because it was a whole age of heavy rock, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, uh, Iron Butterfly, uh, there's probably 20 other ones, Deep Purple. But I, I would just go to the record store Almost every day, <laughs> where I wound up with 3,000 albums. And I lived in a place called Nutley, New Jersey, where I would have parties at age 18, 19, um, up in this carriage house that we had in the back. And it was so loud by 1 o'clock that normally the police would show up, but they didn't want to come up the stairs because they didn't like the funny smells. So they would just shine a flashlight and go, Mark, time to shut down. <laughs> so people would come over, I mean, like 50, 100 people a night. Because 
that by that time I had already toured with Donovan, who was huge back then. There was the Beatles, Rolling Stones, and Donovan were mm-hmm. the top three back in the world. And, and I was a 16-year-old. I, I moved to England to rehearse, and then we toured the States. And, uh, so I was kind of basically like a little star in my town. So the police didn't want to bother me, and I also could go to the Nutley Pub and drink at 17 when the, I think the legal age was 21. But they would let me in because I would always bring 50 people with me. So before you began working for the Muppets and Sesame Street, did you have any familiarity with those franchises at all? Um, well, I mean, watched them like all kids did. But do you want me to tell you how I got involved with them? I guess. Oh, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> if if you if you want to, you can. Sit back, and make popcorn. I'll try and keep it under two minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was trying to CBS records in the eighties, uh, CBS songs in the eighties, and I was writing for like Michael Bolton, all kinds of people, or with them, and just put in a, uh, a cassette of all the what they thought were their top songs. Um that had not yet been recorded. Hmm. So somehow Barbara Streisand got a hold of one of my songs. Some good thing that never last. Anyway, so um, I go to fly to California and uh, like, and then Phil Ramone was her producer. Now Phil Ramone had, eight, he, he had 18 Grammys over his career. 18 different Grammys. I eventually wound up moving in with Phil. So <laughs> Phil introduced me to Jim Henson and they loved the first four songs I did and that's how I got involved in Muppets Go to Disney. I did a whole bunch of other things called Muppets on Wheels. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's how, because of Phil, I was introduced to Jim. And then I became fairly good friends with Jim who would call me up and go, Hello. I go, don't, don't do that. Don't do the Kermit thing. You freak me out. Like a doll staring at me or something. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Stations like this with Jim. Mm. Jim would say, Okay, Gonzo and the Chicken are in Disney World, and they're in the bottom of the Disney World in a laundry uh, a laundromat, but they think it's a ride. And I went, Okay, uh, give me about an hour. So then I call him back and I go, Love in a laundry mat. Who would have thought of that? I can't believe it. Love at first cycle. I was like, Brian! <laughs> oh my gosh. Love it. Wow. You said, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Sure do. Kind of jokes inside a kid's show. Yes. Like, well, uh, Jim, what's the relationship between Gonzo and the chicken? He's like, we don't really like to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, gotta love Gonzo and the chickens. They still don't. <laughs> yeah, they have this kind of weird relationship. They're always hanging out, but... Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. But... that? Um, so I had like four or five songs in Muppets Go to Disney, and I was there, which was really cool because... I was in Disney with them while they were shooting it, and Jim was the kind of guy where he'd shoot 10 or 15 minutes of footage and then go back to writing, like, what was next. So everybody was involved. It wasn't like there was a full script. Right. You know what I mean? So, like, the next day, it was like, okay, we're going to have Epcot Center, we're going to have a band, uh, and we need, like, a rock song, and we're going to get, like, Edgar Winter or, uh, yeah. I think Edgar Winter, one of the winners to do a sax part for it, but we needed it to be rock. So I'm like, okay. And this like happened, so I get told that in the morning, and by the next day I was like over there with rock and rolling the world around, rock and rolling the world around. And there was some kind of twist in there, rock and rolling, rolling, rocking the world away, I forget, whatever. But it came out good. Nice. So it was fun. It was fun to hear what they were going to do next. They loved the laundromat when they first wrote it. They loved the idea of the Love at First Cycle and you sent me spinning. But the uh, producer at the time, he said, it's a beautiful ballad, 
and we can't do a damn thing with it. I'm like, why? He's like, it just sounds too pretty. It's got to be goofier. It's got to be more muppetier. So I came back three hours later. Okay, perfect. Now we got it. So it keep changing while we were working. So I was down there for like a month just doing that. And uh, watching the Muppets trying to get inside the rides so you could only see the Muppets while they had to sit underneath the seats. Somebody would have to um, strap Tim Henson underneath the chair of the roller coaster so he could hold up a puppet that was supposed to be sitting on the roller coaster. Like all kinds of things like that would be going on. Yeah, so I'm I'm actually kind of curious, you know, since you talked about, I know this, I know Jake, this was uh, your question, but I do kind of, um, I'm curious since you worked with Jim Henson a lot, can you share any, uh, stories from working with, uh, Jim and getting to know him? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of sad, but I guess I, I can go this way. Uh, three days before he passed away, and it was sudden, Jim was, uh, he had something called developing pneumonia. Right, but yeah. Three days before that, I was in the city in Manhattan with him, and we were working on French speaking cockroaches. Don't ask me. And that was the mind of Jim. So I was in there, and then I called, like, on Monday, I'm and uh, I didn't get an answer at his apartment, so I called the office or something. I'm like, Jim passed away last night. I'm like, what? He was, he was supposed to be three days ago. He was that rapid. He was uh, working on something else when he started just feeling really sick. And then eight hours later, he was gone. But I did go to his funeral. Mm-hmm. And 4,000 people in the church in New York City. And it turns out, of course, being Jim, he wrote his own funeral beginning, which was uh, recited by his son. And the very first sentence that was recited now, do you, do you know it? Uh, uh, his, his son's Brian. Oh, Brian. Yeah, Brian. 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 Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So Brian walked up there. There's 4,000 people in a church. And Brian said, my father wrote his own, uh, like, goodbye. I don't know when he did it, maybe three or four years beforehand or something, but just in case. So the very first sentence was, first of all, I would like it to be a small gathering. (laughs) (laughs) So he immediately got us laughing from the grave in one sentence, like he did his whole life. He had us laughing already. There's 4,000 people laughing at the first sentence. Fast forward to the end of the speech, and he said, uh, it might be a little bit to ask, but if it's at all possible, I mean, a, a lot to ask, but if it's at all possible, I would like to have 76 trombones and a big parade. And wouldn't you know, five minutes later, 76 trombones and a big parade came through the church. All kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, they pulled me into the crowd that was marching with the band. Everybody marched out of the church like that. Oh, yeah. And just as a coincidence, or what I would call God's sense of humor, the <laughs> person that introduced me to Phil Ramone, since they sat people in alphabetical order, Radice Ramon, I sit down and Phil's sitting next to me. <laughs> oh, wow. That's interesting. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. The, the odds of that happened. Right? So, I know, yeah. So I go and I go, do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now moving on from the Muppets and uh, with, you know, Sesame Street, how did you begin working for them? Clash, who used to be Elmo. Yes, love Kevin. When he was with the Muppets, yes. when Kevin was with the Muppets, he had in a band called Solid Foam. Uh, so Kevin knew me from all the Muppet songs that I wrote, and I was in some weird area in my life, probably 2004 or 2005, where I said, I just called. I called Kevin. I found his number. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm looking for something to do. I missed the whole Muppet thing. He was like, oh, man, we've been looking all over for you. I'm like, you could have called. 
Right. Oh yeah, I've heard some stories about him. Yeah. Cute old, cute mm-hmm. old uh, Jewish guy who's probably seventy-five, eighty years old. So I get this call from Danny, and he says, "How you doing, kid?" He always called me kid. Like, uh, he goes, "How you doing, kid?" Uh, all right, this is the way things. This is how we do things around here. He was trying to do stuff with me, and I said. It's probably going to be the way you used to do things around here. He says, I like you, kid. You got spunk. So he says, I got this thing. It's a lyric. It's called, uh, you learn something new every million years. It's by a dinosaur. He goes, can you have it for me by the end of next week? I said, Danny, I can have it for you by dark. So I send it to him by dark. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, do you have any, well, I know you wrote a lot, but do you have any favorite songs you got to write for Sesame Street? I would say my most favorite is one called Proud. Oh, love yes. Proud. Yes, yes, I love that song. Yes, amazing. Ke- Kevin and yes. Kevin and uh, Bill Beretta, they did a fantastic right. job on that song. Oh, yes. It was, it was pretty incredible. But, uh, Kevin called, and he didn't sound like Kermit. Hello! He didn't do that to me. <laughs> Kevin, like, he's hello. <laughs> On the phone, he's a six-foot black man, right? So, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd get a call from him, hey, mister, hey. <laughs> Which was more like his Muppet voice. <laughs> but he's like, hey, mister, uh, we're doing this thing for the army, and we got, like, uh, Elmo and his dad, but we need a song about how proud his dad is of Elmo. So I did my usual, all right, give me a couple hours. And he, I call him up. Hey, mister, what you got? Did you write the proud song? I go, yeah, I did. And he goes, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> when I write songs like that, I know they're going to be well received because it's, it's so easy for me after thousands and thousands of songs if I get like a thing. I need a song about a coffee cup falling off a table in slow motion. Okay, you got it. So if he tells me, <laughs> I need a song about uh, proud about how proud Elmo is of his dad. When I sit down at the piano and I know that it's going to go right to Sesame Street, it's almost as if the song is already there. There's a uh, an analogy where sculptors who used to work in marble would say, the marble, the statue is already in the marble. All you have to do is chip away at the at the marble everything that isn't the statue. Make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another uh so another when, I'm thinking proud, uh, when, when I'm thinking proud, I'm just like hitting the piano. Ching, 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 ching. And I'm like, this song is already written. It's kind of like when I throw my stocks down the stairs because I want to remember to put them in the laundry. Uh, when I see the socks land at the bottom of the stairs, I'm like, they were always there, and I just had to walk myself through my life to put them there. But they were already there. So to me, crowd was already there. All I had to do was figure out what wasn't in the song. All mm-hmm. the rest of it was proud as anyone could be. You know, proud, that's what you make me. I'm like this, I better start recording this because it's already here. And it took me uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes, tops. Wow. Wow. Because it seemed wow. like it was already there, you know? And I sent it mm-hmm. to Kevin, and, and I got, Kevin used to send me block letters because he was not very, <laughs> not very email savvy. Hmm. And <laughs> also, he spelled a lot of things wrong. So I would call him and I'd go, you're Elmo, and you spell things wrong. And he would say, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah, and and another song that um, you you, uh, wrote is uh, Puppet Man. Oh, Puppet Man, yes. Kevin, uh, his birthday was coming up, or something. (laughs) Hey, mister. So his birthday came up, and he and he said, uh, uh, I, I, and he was 
even a little sheepish about it. He said, I was just wondering, Radice, could you, uh, could you write me a birthday song? Like a song for my birthday about my life. And I said, well, gee, Kevin, would you like it to be a surprise? <laughs> oh surprise. Birthday song. So, so I spent, that, that, that was a couple of days of just research with me going into Wikipedia and everything and watching some things about him as a kid. And uh -huh. I did that whole track is me again. Um, I'm the whole band on that. Now this is, that's a little different because that wound up in his um, being Elmo a puppeteer's journey. Yes, that was, love that. Mm -hmm. that yeah, it's yeah. great talking to Mary. I think they might have used a different track for that. Oh, maybe that's what you're talking about. They might have used a different track because I, I know they used a different singer for that. Hmm. Yeah, and yeah, that might be it. Yeah. Right. If you go to Mark Lee's Uncuffed on Spotify, there's my version that I sent him. And then mm, okay. Got the birthday thing. Thank you, thank you, Mister. And uh, he got the birthday song, and then he was doing that. He was shooting all that, uh, the journey thing, and they decided to use it as a credit as, at the end of the credits. Mm -hmm. But they did bring in. Did you bring in another vocalist? So I'm wrong about that. I apologize. That's okay. Oh, I... Yeah, Kathy, you're recording. No, no worries. No worries. But we did say not that person, but not mine. Right. You no also worries. you also uh, co-wrote, and I think you also sang on the song uh, "Tickle Me Land" oh, for yeah. Elmo's World. Yeah, if you look it up on YouTube, that's all me, and I'm the singer. So it's the band coming out of. The Disenchanted Cottage, which was the name of my studio slash three room cottage that I had in Keensburg, New Jersey. So that's basically what you're hearing is just 18 of me. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Awesome. What was that? Yeah. We were just talking about. Huh? Uh, tickle Me Land. Right, right. So if you go on YouTube, the only thing that isn't me on YouTube, because they have it there, is just Elmo. Just going, <laughs> like, there's a song. <laughs> I called Kevin, I'm like, just laugh for a few minutes. Because I need to put it in the song. But the rest of it is, uh, you know, Dolphy has a place in her head where everything is wonderful, furry and red. So, and it's, and it's my, I, I use it sonic keyboards. They're so old, they use floppy disks. I still use them to this day. Wow. You actually have to pop it floppy disk, and then it will, it oh will record gosh. within the keyboard. Mm. So it records within the keyboard, and then I take the entire track and dump the entire track into a workstation, and then I sang over it. And uh, and that's what they used. That's what SESB used for that. Nice. Yeah. Again, a performance royalties issue. Because there's no Sesame Street band on there, and if it's all released. Right, mm. yeah. In the words of my grandfather, eh, what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. What are you going to do? So, did, oh, you have, did you have any favorite characters to write for on Sesame Street or the Muppets? Oh yeah, yeah. A song about oh, Elmo. Yeah. Love that one. Yeah. yeah uh huh. Yeah. Yes, that's a. And uh, <laughs> Adam couldn't couldn't get the second chord, which I call a spider chord, because I I taught myself to I taught myself to um, play instruments myself. Like I never had any lessons, so I named a lot of my chords things that aren't actually chords that you would call. No, there's no such thing as a spider chord in real music but Adam couldn't get the spider chord so I, I drove out to uh, Sesame Studio and I met Adam and I tried to show him the spider chord he was like could I just use my thumb I'm like sure and, and I'll, I'll play the guitar <laughs> mm -hmm. like, I'll just send you the guitar you can sing it if you watch Adam Sandler on Song About Elmo on YouTube, you can see it's two different guitars, hmm. right? Because you're 
you're Interesting. listening to me, but you're watching him. Mm. Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so there's that. And I'm like, that is where he was supposed to play the spider chord. And you can hear the spider chord, but he's using his thumb. But it was, mm-hmm. it was fun. I mean, it was great to meet him. Yeah. Call me buddy all day. Aww. Hey, buddy. Aww. <laughs> Uh, and he was like, so, do you write anything else besides Sesame songs? And I was like, yeah, I wrote a few. At the time, I had like a <laughs> thousand songs. Mm. Like, yeah, I wrote a couple oh. other things. You feel like getting into it with them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, do you write anything else for anybody else? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I was just going to uh, quickly bring up, so on, on Sesame, you also uh, wrote a lot of music for some of the specials they did, like uh, Elmo's Christmas Countdown. Sure. Um, uh, I actually did <laughs> the whole special, that whole uh, Christmas Countdown, I think is 48 minutes long by the time they put commercials in and everything to make it an hour. Mm. But uh, I remember being in the Disenchanted Cottage, and I was doing 16-hour days and working on it. Because wow. the, the front of almost Christmas countdown, even there's somebody sliding down a mountain of snow or something, and I was trying to underscore it, and I kept, it took me <laughs> 20 minutes to write. Underscoring... Like some some guy skiing down a mountain took me probably four hours for 20 seconds because he was coming down the mountain and I had to hit it correctly when he crashed. I didn't have Simpty or any of that stuff back then. So I was writing... <laughs> like that. <laughs> Just a millisecond off. And like, oh, man. it forever and I'm like that is so that's it's five seconds of the whole thing and I'm trying to get oh, I'm just gonna need three more notes <laughs> finally hit and then from there it's like okay here's the next section but uh one of my favorite things about that was Cheryl Crow did a Ritis song called It's Almost Christmas oh it's yes that's a great Christmas. one I went right back to stealing from the Beatles. <laughs> when I was a kid, because all it did was uh, the move is up, the time is right for simply having mm. a wonderful Christmas time. Mm. It's Paul McCartney. Yeah. But mine goes, it's almost mm. Christmas, it's almost Christmas. Ever since yeah. it's like the same feel as as Paul. And doesn't he wish he was me now? But. Mm. But it was the same feel. And again, Cheryl came in, and I actually have a picture of us, and she didn't like the sound of her $3,000 guitar, so I brought in my $300 acoustic. And she liked that sound better, but we didn't have enough time. So we shot her. Uh, I remember the, the, the set and snow coming down. I'm like, what are you guys using for snow? They're like, we have these blowing machines and they're blowing soap suds hmm <laughs> interesting dots of, soap, dots of soap coming down right yeah all, all during mm. Cheryl's thing and I'm watching <laughs> watching her trying to remember the chords for it but she couldn't remember my fun, the funniest spot was there was a section where Elmo was supposed to be talking to her hey Miss Cheryl or whatever and she's she's singing and talking to him and two or three times just because the way it was uh, written in the script she kept hitting, hitting Elmo in the head with her guitar because she had to turn to another camera oh wow she kept whacking him in the neck oh like, with, with her guitar neck so we had to get that oh. right but then again almost like, exactly like with Adam Sandler since she couldn't she didn't have time I mean, she was Cheryl Crow she was very busy Mm-hmm. So she didn't have time to uh, learn the chords and shoot the thing and get out of there in time. So she just we strapped the guitar on her and she played what she thought was a, what she thought might have been the chords or kind of looked like the chords. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
and I got a hold of the audio of Cheryl's guitar, which was nothing like my guitar that they used in the show. Hers was like, bang, 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 I sent her the video with her guitar. I'm like, this is what it would really sounded like if we used your guitar. <laughs> the, the banter in the studio with Leslie and Kevin was almost as good as when Jim Henson and Frank Oz were in the studio. The bantering that went on oh. that nobody heard mm. is uh, mm. just her, her crazy. Like, uh, Leslie would be on the microphone doing her Abby. <laughs> and then once they shut the tape, or not the tape, they were recording. I just dated myself. <laughs> song for a Tina Fey in that uh, Pirates episode that they did. Uh, Buccaneers. Yeah, that was that was Buccaneers. I, I have a thing here. Hold on. Uh, Big Hit 2, Bye Bye Binky, Dirt, Dirt, Dirt. That was fun. Elmo's Riding, Elmo's Ducks. Enough left to go around. Oh, Elmo's, Elmo's, du- Elmo's, Elmo's Ducks is a good one. Yeah, that's another really good one. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Elmo's Ducks. Elmo's Ducks now has 110 million views on YouTube. A wow. Get three, a normal songwriter would get $3,000 per million views. That wow. one song that I'm talking about has $110 million. If I do the math, $100 million, well, $3,000 for a million, $30,000 for $10 million, $300,000 for $100 million. Wow. What a normal songwriter would get. My last check, royalties for ASCAP. For almost Ducks was fourteen dollars. I have one hundred and four million views on just that one. But mm. getting back to this, preschool musical was fun. Uh, Pirates Who Love to Read was good. Tina Fey. I wasn't there for that. Some of them I didn't get to. But I just busy doing other stuff. I could go to every one. Mm-hmm. The norm. The normal routine for me and Sesame was they would because they knew how fast I was, like from the very beginning with the Danny Epstein, and like, Danny, I could have this song Beat by Dark. So what they used to do is uh, schedule the set list, schedule the set for the song, then send me the script. Like they would send me the script on Wednesday. And the set, the shooting of the song that I didn't write yet, they would set for Friday. So I had 48 hours. Like for the Shoe Fairy, which has a... Uh, does that. So it's pretty cool. Three name three names. The guy. But um hmm. what, what was the point? Oh, six penguins in my shirt was good. Yeah, there's a uh, who is this guy? Maybe if I click it it'll work. She carries a song performed by Neil Patrick Harris. Yes. Oh cool. yes. You can hear you can, again, you can hear on um, the shoe fairy. Until you start to recognize my Insonic keyboard, it has the same sound. Like, you know, if you're listening to 
Eric Clapton play guitar, you go, that's Eric Clapton. Right? So for the Shoe Fairy, obviously, they used my track. But it was a lot of fun to write because it's so crazy. And I can see, in a way, why they wouldn't want the Sesame Street band to try and copy my track because there's so much stuff going on it. And like with the Shoe Fairy, it's like, I got shoes that'll make you hot. I got shoes. It's got all this crazy Denise stuff in it. And it would take the Sesame Street band 10 hours to learn all the parts that I put to it. So in a way, I can almost backtrack and go, I can see why they used my stuff. But it just wasn't fair that they paid the band. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Six Penguins and McSure was really cool. And then, this is actually listed here, you learn something new every million years. That's the very first one I wrote for Sesame. Nice. But that can go pretty cool. Nice. It's just a, it's just a, a skippy thing. And it's weird, because <laughs> Danny was the first guy I talked to. He's a little Jewish guy. I adored him to pieces. But uh, the dinosaur is Jewish. It's like, you learn something new every million years. The, on the subject of celebrities, you've also written a number of songs for celebrities outside of Sesame Street. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, uh, the, uh, a song I did when I was 10, <laughs> <laughs> was ten uh, called 10,000 Year Old Blues. I found uh, a book of my mom's old poetry. And it was like, I was born 10,000 years ago. There's nothing in this world that I don't know. And I thought it was funny for a 10-year-old kid to be singing that he was 10,000 years old. So I took that music. I mean, I took those like that poem. It was kind of a poem. And I just put a blues thing to it. Now, at the time, my dad was recording a band called Chain Reaction. And Chain Reaction's drummer yeah. was Stephen Tallarico eventually became Steve Tyler. Mm -hmm. So Steve Tallarico, at 20 years old, was on a 10-year-old Mark Redis single called 10,000-Year-Old Blues as the drummer. You can look up 10,000-Year-Old Blues. I don't think there's a YouTube version of it, but uh, you can look it up online and you'll find it somewhere. But it's actually Steve Tyler, lead singer of Aerosmith, also mm -hmm. playing bass marimba in the front. I was telling people, doesn't Steve Tyler wish he was me now? Mm -hmm. But um, that was uh, the first thing, I like, guess, playing with celebrities. As far as writing with celebrities, uh, I have to go back into my own wiki page here. Uh, let's just talk about me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. <laughs> um, but 
So I used to make a living off of selling records when you had to go to the store and buy records. But then in 2004, it occurred to me, they're making MP3s now, and MP3s can be copied by anybody that can email them. And that was kind of the demise of my being able to live off of my records. That was the end of that. And I wound up doing cover gigs, like, like at the Jersey Shore, where I would be doing, like, people would come up to me and go, you know any Bruce Springsteen? And I'd go, why does he know any of mine? And they'd go, huh? <laughs> well, there was one bartender there. He's like, "You're Mark Radice. What are you doing in a cover band?" And I said to him, "These <laughs> got me. If I take the beer outside into the parking lot and copy the beer and give it to a hundred people, you know, there's a hundred and one beers in the parking lot. That is what's happening with music now. People can just take." what they hear as an mp3 and copy it in two clicks they don't have to buy it anymore and that is why i'm in the cover you you've written a number of songs for celebrities outside of sesame street yes that's what i was mentioning that's, um, i just i just raffled them off from my wikipedia page mm. <laughs> mm. so, I, so i answered that question yeah we No. <laughs> no. No. We're not we're not looking at the floor. I'll definitely right. say that. You're looking at each other like what the hell did we get ourselves into? <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean sometimes but not not all the time though. All right, well thank you for being kind. Mm -hmm. Of course, yes. Uh, of course. Of course. Um, so over the years, as as you uh, brought up Donovan and Cheap Trick and Aerosmith, you've toured with them. What was it like going on a road on the road and touring with these bands? Um, with Aerosmith, we were it was seventies, late seventies. I was just getting. Uh, I had the disco record that was a hit all over the East Coast, but Steve and Tyler who used to be my drummer when I was 10, he was getting huge with Aerosmith. So he called me up. He's like, we're looking for... Now, actually, I just come off a Donovan tour, and I was in L.A., and Steve saw me in the lobby of, I think it was the Lermitage Hotel or something, and I saw him, I saw him, and we both pointed at each other just before the elevator door closed. But all I saw was... Muh! supposed to be Mark. <laughs> he got off at the second floor. I was running down the spiral staircase. He's like, what the hell are you doing here? I mean, <laughs> talk about being at the right place at the right time. Right? Mm -hmm. He said, uh, man, we're looking for keyboard and vocals. I know you're phenomenal. You want to come join the band? I'm like, I just, I just joined. I just, just, this is like the third to last day of the Donovan tour, which is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to go home. He's like, "Well, we're not going. We're not going out for two or three months." He's like, and he looks at me. He's like, "We got our own plane." And I'm like, "I hate flying." <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll let you write some of the songs. And I said, "When do I leave?" <laughs> I'll let you write some of the songs. Fast forward two years later, some morning we wrote something called Bluebird, I think. Mm. Two years into me touring with them. <laughs> was the only time we ever came close to writing anything together. Mm. But at the time, I was 20 and touring with Aerosmith. I'm all over the country and I'm doing this and stuff like that. And, and uh, I think I'm going home. You know, like when you're a kid and you're waiting for the school bell to ring. Do you have school bells anymore? Do bells ring, or how do you know when the class is? Over? Um, 
Yeah, I I graduated from I'm I'm 23. I just graduated from high school like five years ago. And last last I know, I think they still had school bells. Jakey, you would know. You're you're younger than me. Did they did did they have school school bells when you were in high school? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Same yeah. same for okay, me. Okay. So they still have. Yeah. Them. yeah. They still. Okay. They still have them. Okay. So the analogy that I would be drawing, just so you understand, is like you you can't wait most of the days for the bell to ring. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so I'd be on the tour with Aerosmith doing the same songs over and over. Now keep in mind that I had already written two thousand of my own originals, and now I'm stuffed in the back behind PA systems. Most of the audience can't see me, but I'm there doing vocals and, and piano. And then I would get to be like a week before the tour was over. I'm like, wow, that's the equivalent to five minutes before the bell's going to ring. I'm like, just one more week and I get to go home. I've been on the road for 10 months with these guys playing keyboards that you can't really hear. So I had to play the top of the keyboard to get past the noise. I mean, guitars. <clears throat> so the keyboard would be like, ding, 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 ding. I'd get past Joe Perry and Brad Whitford's guitars. Uh, about a week before the tour was supposed to end, we would have a meeting with the manager, and the manager would go, well, you know, the thing is going so great, and we're selling out everywhere. We just added six more weeks. So the equivalent would be like, you're thinking that the bell's going to ring in 10 minutes, but then your teacher says, you know, we're having such a great class right now. We're going to wait for the, we're going to add another half an hour before the bell rings. And then by the time you get 10 minutes up to the bell ringing, the teacher says, you know, we're having such a great time here today. We're going to make the bell ring an hour later. <laughs> so it's a oh. trick with, uh, with Aerosmith because every time it was about a week, I would be frantic that their manager was going to have a meeting. And it almost always happened. So 10 months would turn into a year or three months of touring and doing the same song. When, when you're touring with a major band, every day is the same, but only some of the scenery changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So my parents actually called me one, one night from somewhere, and I'm just out there floating around and touring and doing the same shows every night. And of course... When you're touring with a major band and you pull into somewhere like Boston or Detroit or Los Angeles, because you're in the town, everybody in town wants to party with you. So after the shows, the parties would last because of a certain white powder way up until around like 6 a.m. And then we'd have to get on a plane at 10 a.m. every single day. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Sound check, 3 p.m., show, 8 p.m., party starts, 11 p.m., goes on to 6 a.m., get up, 10 a.m., <laughs> <laughs> get on a plane, go to the next town, sound check at 3 p.m., like that, over and over and over and over and over. Oh, and my, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so my parents called me, and they were like, uh, where are you? And I was like, I don't know. I'll have to check my itinerary. What date is it? And they say, like, it's, it's the 21st. And they go, apparently I'm in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> well. So you also perform a lot of your own songs live at various events. Do you have any, like, favorite solo songs you've written? Oh, oh sure. Uh, well, obviously, Some Good Things Never Last, because that was re uh, recorded by Barbara Streisand and Barry Manilow and 62 other people on YouTube. But uh, there's one of mine called I Was Justin Bieber Way Before He Was. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that is on YouTube, and it's got this whole thing of me, which after you finish this interview and watch that, You'll be like, now I kind of get release. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. and the reason that I wrote that is because at the time, at the time, 
YouTube was just forming, and, and people were trying to figure out ways to get people to watch their YouTube videos. At the same, during that week, Justin Bieber was getting so many hits on his new, so many views on his new song. Yeah. That my smart idea was, it would look like, I mean, I was, I was literally watched the new Justin Bieber thing on YouTube as the comments were coming in every five seconds from people. Mm. It was just every five <laughs> seconds somebody else would be in it. So my smart, my smart, I almost said the, the A word, my smart aleck idea was if I put the words Justin Bieber, Bieber in my title and people click on YouTube for Justin Bieber, mm-hmm. it could possibly come up I was Justin Bieber way before he was. Because I was. <laughs> <laughs> he started like he started like when he, when he was twelve. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was seven. Mm-hmm. So it actually goes I was Justin Bieber way before he was. Except that I was better. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, and then in the background it goes, way. Like, is it way better? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's one of my favorites, and people are laughing at that. It's just my, my sense of humor. I have to learn sometime right. before I die not to blame everything on somebody else other than myself, because obviously I, I get myself into these situations, and then I'm like, well, now it's your fault that I'm here. Hmm. Almost everything that I described. I'm going to have to teach myself. You know, it was really a really good run, and you got to do hundreds of things that most normal people don't even do. Right. So you really can't beat there's good head in everything. You know, it was wonderful to work with Kevin as Elmo. It was wonderful to. It was wonderful to be in in uh, New Jersey and working on a new Sesame Street song and at the same time I'd have the TV on and I would hear something that I wrote a month before and it's also wonderful to know as a songwriter that working with Sesame Street that they're playing in over a hundred countries and whatever it is that you're writing I mean I had a probably 97% rate of first shot first shot, like, I would send them a song, and it would be like, perfect. The other 3% would go, can you change? One of my favorite things with Sesame is they're like, could you add another verse to this song and make it shorter? (laughs) 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 You can only get, like, two minutes for a song. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I'm like, okay, you want me to add another verse to this song and make it shorter. So I sent them back. It sounded like this. <laughs> and they call me back. What the hell is this? And I'm like, that's what you asked me for. Gosh. <laughs> so, um, so I'm kind of curious. Do you have any like favorite performing locations? Favorite performing locations? Uh, I really, I like. I played Madison Square Garden three times, which is kind of cool. oh, wow. Uh, wow. Was... Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Once with Donovan, twice with Aerosmith. What? Uh, nice. Awesome. That's cool. I mean, you know, because the old the old saying goes, "How do you get to Madison Square Garden?" Practice, man. Practice. Yep. That's the old joke. Yep. But uh, <laughs> it, it was amazing to me to be 20 years old and at my third time mm. at 20 in the garden. Yeah. You know, that's cool. And then there's uh, I played in Philadelphia one night. Now it's amazing because we can. I played for 50,000 people that I couldn't see night after night after night after night after night for years. And then my dad showed up at a show in Philadelphia. And all of a sudden, I was seven years old again. And I was making mistakes I didn't know I could make. <laughs> my dad 
cameras in the audience. So I'm like, he's, he's, watch, he's watching my every move. <laughs> 50,000 50, other people that have no idea who I am, but I'm like all of a sudden nervous wreck. So 50,000 people means nothing, but my father, I'm like, oh man, it should have been a B flat. I'm thinking in my head. Mm. But another time I played was a California jam with Aaron Smith, and that was 250,000 people. Mm. Somebody called helicopters. <laughs> so they took us out of the limos, put us in <laughs> helicopters, and we, and we landed 20 feet behind the stage. Wow. We got out of the helicopter, and, it was and I'm looking at the sea, 250,000 people in front of me. And I played one note on the keyboard, and it went ding, 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 off into space. And I looked at my finger, and I said, did we just do that? So, so aside from that, you've also uh, done some uh, songwriting work for companies like AT and T and American Greetings. Can you kind of touch base a bit on your uh, work with them? Sure. AT and T was just uh, was I think for a convention, um, like some big convention. I had to do uh, twenty minutes of just convention music or whatever that is which is similar to like when you're the trick to being a um, an underscorer for a movie is you have to convey an emotion but you also have to make music so that it's you can't make the music so noticeable that people notice it <laughs> hmm. if you're watching a movie like a, a prime example is Jaws you're not really paying attention to the fact that music going uh, right you're just aware that it's right so you have to match the music to what you're looking at and that's the key to be an underscore or a, a, or a movie writer right so like back to uh, the Elmo thing Christmas countdown with the with the snow and the if you ask people, what did you just see? I'd say 98% of the people say, I just saw some sky skiing down a mountain and it crashed. The other 2% would say, somebody had to write the underscoring for that, so it sounded like... <laughs> Nobody even pays attention to it. If, you, if, you're, if your music is not being paid attention to, but is conveying the feeling that you're looking at, then you did your job. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Once, once Sesame, once I go going back a half an hour from now, once I realized that Sesame was basically lying to me, I decided to leave them. And then I was uh, sitting in New Jersey going, what am I going to do next? And then my friend had just moved to Tennessee. I've been in Tennessee now for 11 years. My friend was out there in the at a Christmas party talking about yeah, we got a band out here in Tennessee, and they call them the Swampers, and we're doing country. We're just doing, like, basically country karaoke. We just copy the country top 20 songs of the week, and then we put it on karaoke sites, and they're making, like, $450 a day. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't I go do that? So I put all I owned from New Jersey into a truck and moved and drove it down here to Tennessee, where I am right now. And after about four days, I talked to my friend, who I shall re remain nameless, and I said, okay, I'm here, I'm done with Sesame, I need to make a living, and where's this Swampers thing with $450 a day? And he said, oh, that's only one day a month. Wow. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> so, a month later, we came up with something called Sing and Spell, hmm. which you can find on two what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you go to 2B Kids, there's a thing called Sing and Spell. And uh -huh. I'm like yeah. seven cartoon characters. They made me a cartoon character. They made me seven cartoon characters. I'm uh, Seymour uh -huh. Trax. My country guy is Luke Warmwater. And he sounds like this. And today we're going to talk about the letter X. 
Yeah. Um, so you are also writing a book about your time on Sesame called What Happened on the Street. Can you talk about that? I pretty much did in Drips and Drabs so far. But What Happened on the Street is a chapter from my book that I've been writing for 30 years. My friend now has called it Can He Write a Book? <laughs> <laughs> but I've been writing years and 30 years and it starts with uh, pretty much the interview with the whole thing and Steve Tyler and being my drummer Steve was 20 when he was my drummer and I was 10 uh, then it goes through the Donovan and the Aerosmith the Cheap Trick we haven't really touched on Cheap Trick which for, for once was a totally completely happy experience I have to say it was a great pleasure to me, the band that I was a fan of, and be able to write for them. Oh, that's nice. No, mm. and um, with that, with CBS songs, uh, informed me that Epic Records was about to drop Cheap Trick because their sales were dropping, and they were looking for a professional songwriter. And as it turned out, Cheap Trick used to open for Aerosmith. So mm -hmm. once again, being yeah. in the right place at the right time. Rick Nielsen put two and two together because I met him and the band while I was touring with Aerosmith and they got wind of me being a songwriter and we would sit in the hotel rooms and play songs back and forth to each other and stuff like that. And Rick really liked my writing. So when Epic informed him, we're thinking nice. you need to get a hold of a professional songwriter for the next record, Rick called me. And uh, he said, Look, they got me in a spot here. Uh, I was wondering if you'd come up to uh, Rockford, Illinois. I said, absolutely. I loved you guys for years. So so I, I got on a plane. I, I went to Rick's house. Uh, he brought out a shoebox. They just made a ton of money from Live at Budokan. Mm -hmm. They bought up about 40 houses that were empty in their town. So Rick brought out a shoebox with a bunch of house keys. And then he gave me a piece of paper with addresses. He's like, take one of these houses to live in for two months. Mm. <laughs> I got my rent car with my 40 hotel keys and addresses and a map because cars didn't have a waiting. They had no GPS back then. Mm -hmm. I went to about four or five houses and I finally picked one. Uh, I'm sure yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, 40, 40, days in a row. So 40 days in a row around 8 p.m. The whole band would show up in the basement and hang out. It was kind of like a party, and I would play them what I thought of. That well, the first thing I did when I got there is I, I went to each individual member the first week, and I just got to meet each an individual member of Cheap Trick, and I'm like, what do you want Cheap Trick to sound like next? So I would spend a whole day just getting to know everybody. And then I called all five of them, or all four of them, four or five of them together. And I'm like, all right, well, here's some things I came up with based on what everybody says they want to sound like. And at first they were very uh, standoffish because like, man, we kind of use another right. But they loved what I was doing, but it wasn't them, you know? So I knew... I, I kept working on it and working on it for a few four, four or five days and then eventually I could hear them talking in the corner. You know, I really like this this one spot here. Damn. <laughs> so, so, so if they're not talking to me about it, but if they're talking about it, I'm on to something. Uh. Oh, and I do also, because I forgot to bring it up, but um, I do want to quickly mention that yesterday before uh, we did the interview, I watched uh, that performance of the song you wrote, uh, Thank You Teachers, where Elmo performed with uh, Peter and Paul. Yes. That was okay. a great one. Mm. Uh, thank You Teachers, that was, uh, thankfully, another good memory. Um called me up, hey mister, and he's like, I'm working with Peter, Paul, and Elmo, Mary's not feeling too well, and uh, it's just going to be Peter, Paul, and Elmo, we can use a song, a uh, teacher appreciation song, so I, I wrote it, uh, they loved it, 
I went into New York City. I actually met with Peter and Paul and Elmo at Peter and Paul. Oh, awesome. Thursday. It was very surreal because I grew up with Peter, Paul, and Mary being 180 years old. But they had a song called Puff the Magic Dragon. Oh, hmm. the Magic oh yes. Dragon. Classic. Which I thought yeah. uh, at the time was a reference to the green leafy substance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but, uh, but so my first thought was just give thank you teachers that feel thank you teachers thank you for showing all of us away so you, you always I take a leap from something that is familiar like the same same thing with you okay. track like you can't just show them a a waltz or a polka R- right <laughs> right sound like them in the first place for mm-hmm. them to go yeah I kind of like that Right. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a, uh, so that's how that it was very surreal and, and great to hang out with them. Uh, actually, Peter and Paul had a book called Puff the Magic Dragon, which they signed for me, which is downstairs next to my fireplace. Oh, um, nice! But, uh, very, an interesting story with that idea in mind of making it sound like them in the first place, so they like it is. I actually had to do a commercial for Pampers and Judy Collins. Now, if you look up a song called I've Looked at Life from Both Sides Now, uh, it was Judy Collins' hugest hit. And I had to write a song for Pampers that Judy was going to sing. So her melody to her biggest hit is, I've looked at life from both sides now. So I counted the syllables on that. I've looked at life from both sides now. Like, okay, that's eight syllables. Now, Pampers wants me to write a song for Judy Collins, and the slogan is, Pampers is dryness from day one. Like, perfect. Eight syllables. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take both sides now and write, write it backwards. So I took, I've looked at life from both sides now, and I wrote, Pampers is dryness from day one. Oh, wow. It's her hit. Backwards. Oh, wow. Gosh. Interesting. So yeah. And she's, like, and she's like, I really like that melody. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, exactly, she never knew. Exactly. So. Since we're since we're kind of getting close to uh, wrapping up, uh, is there anything you're uh, besides the book, of course? Is there anything else you're currently working on that you can share? Uh, sure. Um, let me. How can I do this quickly? I just did a bunch of stuff because I heard that if you get sync placements in TV shows, if you do covers of other people's songs, um, mm-hmm. if if you offer a scene placement to a movie or a commercial, like, for instance, Wild World by Cat Stevens. If you want to put that in your movie, the original version, it's probably about $25,000 from his publishing company that they would require. Hmm. Now, if I do, hint, hint, a version of Wild World that is similar or in some cases might be better, uh, I can offer sync and commercial people like one tenth. I'll go like I'll, I'll let you use my version for twenty five hundred instead of twenty five thousand, and it could be in the movie. So I just did ten of those, and it's called Back in Ten. And if you want to know more about it, please email me at radisongs r a d i s o n g s, which is kind of like Redis songs ever Redis. Radisongs at yahoo.com. If you email me there, I'd, go, I'd like to know more about Back in 10 and leave your phone number. I'll call you like I'm a virtual record store and I will send you to a Dropbox link, which I have been selling for $10 a link and I sold 35 in two weeks. Hmm. It's kind of wow. amazing. So in other words, you I get wow. on the phone with you and I go, hi, so I produce. We're, we're, this is my virtual record store. I have one record in here. Which one would you like? Well, I'd like back in 10. I'm like, okay. 
now here, here's the link. Now do this, do this, do this, do this. Go to the top left hand. It's download if you want to pay me. Here's my PayPal. So again, radisongs at yahoo.com. R-E-D-S-O-N-G-S at yahoo.com with your name and phone number. Nice. Uh, and I've been doing that. Awesome. People have been giving me free previews. Uh, one song, uh, I, one song is five different songs involved inside the song because I can't help myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, uh, and basically, I'm still trying to get that those things into movies or commercials or whatever. Awesome. Um, I did a awesome. bunch of songs that I grew up with. And I stuck in the middle with you, and a couple of Elton John songs. I did. Uh, I can't get no satisfaction from the Stones. Uh, there's a Steely Dan cut in there. Any major dude will tell you. So I, I did that last month. <coughs> there's a, a couple CDs. CD. But a couple projects that are what I call on the runway for me. There's one that's very Beatles sounding called Psychedelic Witches Embedded in Cement. <laughs> Which is what I look at when I see when I see orange cones on the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what it looks like. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then there's another one. Then there's another one on the runway, all originals, called "The Heavenly Sound of Someone or Something Finally Shutting Up." <laughs> which which I think you can relate to once you get me off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> The heavenly sound of someone or something finally shooting up. I'll give you an example. Somebody had a chainsaw out here in Tennessee that went on for two hours. <laughs> and it stopped. Then the stopping of it was the heavenly sound mm-hmm. of someone right. or something shutting up. Right. So, right. So there's about 15 songs there. There's another one on the runway called 60 60 Second Songs. And there's 60 songs that are a minute long. Hmm. And the first one goes, I've only got about a minute. I've only got about a minute to tell you I love you. That's probably a good way to end. Hmm. <laughs> well, you asked. Again, I'm like, what you asked? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that we did that we did so so what would you like to say to those who have supported the projects you've worked on over the years the projects I've worked on mm-hmm. there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's so many thank you everyone I, f- I feel like this is the thing you're going to play at my funeral <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my friends, uh, you know what they're going to say, you know what it's going to say on your grave. Here lies Mark Redis. He used to play with the Aerosmith. <laughs> 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 and then I said, no, they used to play with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, if, yeah, uh, for sure. yes, uh, if people would like yeah, to, uh, yeah. oh, go ahead. Opportunity, you know, mm. I, I appreciate all the opportunity. Amazing life. Uh, I'm still working on the book. I could write a book. I hope it comes out before I leave. You know, because the irony is I'm thinking for three days after I pass away, everything is going to spike. Like all of Spotify and stuff. And then hmm. I'll be like, okay, well, it's too late now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, it works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. so my, mm-hmm. my game at this stage in my career is to get some sort of recognition so that I can have maybe one or two you know, in, Thanks. in my I feel, I feel like 5,600 songs is enough. Mm-hmm. At this point, I'm just a song detective. Who did this and didn't give me credit for that? And mm-hmm. it's, it's like, why would, I, why would I really, I mean, I do it just out of force of habit at this point, but why would I release something like on Spotify, when there's a hundred thousand coming in every day, and 
Right. 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 If people would like to connect with you, where can people find you? I'm on Facebook. I'm pretty easy to find on Facebook. Uh, I usually go on there and I'm like, let me see what my friends that I went to high school with are eating today. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true. That's so true. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Uh, But I can be found there. Also, the Radisongs at Yahoo.com. I generally answer everybody because at this point, you know, I'm sitting out here in Tennessee with my cat, who I adore. Just we'll find a way. So, to so to wrap but, this up, so the the last question that uh, Jake's about to ask is the question that we ask all of our guests at the end. Take it, Jake. Yes. Go ahead, Jake. So, uh, of course, you know this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. So, when you think of, when you think of nostalgia. What do you think of, or can say in your own words, how would you define the word nostalgia? Sounds like something you might have to go to the doctor for. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. Michael Cavanaugh, my friend, has a thing called synesthesia, and it's where you, and he's another, we didn't even touch on that, I have perfect pitch, but one of my friends says, how do you know if somebody has perfect pitch? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Hmm. But my friend Michael Cavanaugh has synesthesia, which means like when he hears a C chord, he sees like the color orange, it kind of blends in. Mm-hmm. And this is from nostalgia. But I said to him, synesthesia, it sounds to me like you're allergic or afraid of synthesizers. Mm. <laughs> that's where the nostalgia thing comes from, I guess. I got I got nostalgia in my left arm. <laughs> <laughs> oh well uh mark thank you so much off in, yes in way. <laughs> yes mark thank you so much for taking the time to do this this was fun yes thank you so much for doing it it's a blast yeah. and... i appreciate you letting me vent and i hope you yeah. keep in some of the vertebrate stories it, it, oh, we will yeah, of course thank yeah. you yeah of course for sure mm-hmm. and and thank you so much mark oh, for, no. for what you do to be a part of our lives you know keep up your great work and see what's next for you can't wait for the book to come out as well. So, really looking yes. forward to that. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, thank you folks for joining us for another Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. We've absolutely enjoyed our time with Mark Radice. And thank you again, uh, Mark. Stay tuned. We've got, we got some wonderful episodes coming, and remember to keep nostalgia alive. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next time. Yes. So long, next folks. time. Take care, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.